Wait, wait, wait. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's time to face. All right. Come on. Come on with me. Here we go. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Evan Bean. I'm a professor at ECU in engineering and uh, a research institute called the Institute for Coastal Science and Policy. So I'm, a, I'm basically a water resources engineer and deal a lot with water quality and looking at ways that we can engineer solutions to water to water quality and water uh, uh, quantity problems. Uh, but I want to find out a little bit about you guys. So where, what schools do we have here? Chicago. Are we 100% Chicago to see purple like everywhere? Is there anywhere, anywhere else that's, that's represented? South Creek. South Creek. Where's South Creek? Where, what? In Martin County. In Martin County. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So we got Chicago and we got South Creek, right? All right. Fantastic. So uh, you guys having a good time today? Yeah. All right. You're not in the classroom, right? It's a way, it's a somewhere outside of that. Okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is water quality. All right, and in the Tar and the Noose River, the two rivers that are really important to uh, how our cities and, and communities thrive, uh, how we enjoy water, how we, why we like to be here in East North Carolina, what makes it special. Uh, and I hope that um, you guys have some feedback. I'm going to have some questions over time. I kind of want some response from you guys, all right? And I hope you'll have some questions at the end. Uh, but we'll see, okay? All right, so just to kind of give get some bearings here, okay? Here's where we're talking about the Noose River Basin right? And then the Tar River Basin, okay? So let's see, uh, it was, it was Creek, well, South Creek, right? South Creek. You guys are up here in Martin County, right? This, right in this area? Yeah. Okay. And then Chicago, you guys are down over here. Still, still in the Tar River Basin, just north of that break line, okay? So just kind of get your bearings there. These are basically the two main rivers in this area or this part of the state, okay? How many of you guys like to be around water? That's it? Man, that's a, low, that's a low percentage compared to what everybody else has been. I love to be around water. My, one of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes that kind of has inspired me and had me go down my, my career path is, it says that if there's any magic in this world, surely it's in water. There's so many ways that we interact with water, so many ways that uh, it, it affects our lives in ways that we know and where we want to we uh, have fun with water, but we need water as well. It also supplies water to you know, the, the, the livestock that, uh, that turns into our dinner, it, it, the, the water that irrigates crops, and that's also uh, things that we dinner. The clothes we wear, we have to rely on water. Okay? So, so I'm, I'm, really interested, I'm really interested in water in all aspects of it. Anybody a fisherman? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, all right? Uh, kayakers, paddlers. Sweet, yep. I love, I love kayaking. If you've never gone kayaking, it's some of the most peaceful times. You can paddle in some really, uh, really forested areas, really nice, okay? Uh, and we all like, like going to the beach, going down to the river, to the lake, yes. All right, how many weeks are left in school? Too many, that's how many. I can't wait to be done either. All right. So, all right, all right, stay with me guys. Okay, so. But we, also, we don't just like to be around water. I love being around water. I love swimming. I love uh, fishing. I love paddling, everything about it. Uh, but we also, like I said, we have to have water. We have to have drinking water, right? Everybody took a shower, hopefully. Maybe, hopefully the person next to you took a shower. That's what's more important, right? And then, but we also drink the water. We have to have it to, to drink, right? We need high quality water, okay? If you're up in the, in the upper Noose Basin, uh, up near Raleigh in that area, their water is typically coming from Falls Lake. All right, that's a, a big reservoir uh, that provides water to a lot of the Triangle, Wake County and Durham County and so forth. You can see a picture of it up top. Uh, down closer to in this area, we used to, not too long ago, get all of our water just about from the ground. Groundwater is great because it's high quality. There's not much that's in that water that you have to take out. Um, it doesn't have, it doesn't have uh, uh, diseases and pathogens in it that we have to be concerned about. So it's really, high, it's really high quality water. We don't have nutrients. The problem that has occurred over the that past 20, 30 years in this part of the state, though, is that we like that water a little too much. Our population was growing a little too much, and we were pulling too much water out such that we started to disappear that water. It wasn't able to sustain how much water we were pulling out. Uh, why, don't, why don't we... Why don't you like to drink the water out of the ocean? It's salty, right? Yeah. You would get, you'd get sick. You'd get sick if you drank a bunch of salt water. All right? And it's really tough 
to remove salt from water. All right, so there are some water plants on the coast of North Carolina, out on the Outer Banks. That's the only supply they have, and they do do de uh, desalinization or reverse osmosis for their water supply. But the pro I bring that up because what was happening here is we were pulling all this water out of the ground, and what it did was it started pulling water from the ocean, basically underground into the into the groundwater. So there's places around like uh, basically Carteret County where you have Moorhead City, Emerald Isle, Jacksonville, those areas. If you go down and go down underground, you're going to hit salt water now where it used to be fresh water. So their well, if you had a well there, a lot of those wells went from being fresh water, which is fine to drink, to starting to be saltier and saltier, which is not fine to drink, right? So we had to cut down on how, much, on how much water we were taking out of the ground. And so places like Kinston and Greenville, we're now getting our water out of the rivers. Okay, so in Greenville, we now pull our water out of the Tar River. And we've been doing that for about 10 or 15 years. Okay, uh, same thing, same similar transition in Kinston as well. They're getting their water out of the Noose River. So there's two main aspects of water that we really care about. All right, the first is quantity. We've got to have enough water, right? If you turned on the tap and there wasn't any water, that would be rather shocking and rather distressing, right? Your water gets shut off, you don't have it available. Uh, all right, I'm not taking a shower today, I'm not getting a glass of water. It's a big transition, all right? In Eastern North Carolina, we're pretty fortunate that we don't have to worry about a quantity water issue, all right? You can look at the map up top, and that shows basically the different colors show how much water the, the, across the state we get in a year. Okay, so the red areas are about four, less than 42 inches, so like three and a half feet. That's about three and a half, I think. All right, the green and yellow, that's getting up to more like the 48 to 50, and that's, and that's, that's more along the lines of what we have here in Greenville in this area, Greenville and Martin County, uh, is more like 48 to 50 inches, about four feet of water. Where is the, where's the most rain occur? Where do you guys see? The rainforest. The rainforest, that's right, where? In the mountains, right? Yeah, usually I have to tell people about it. They're not, they're not aware that it, that it actually is like a small, it is a classified as a rainforest because it gets so much rain uh, in some of our mountain areas. Basically, the mountains are so high that it sort of blocks the clouds from, from migrating past them and sort of causes a lot of the, the rain to, to fall there. So anyway, we don't have a whole lot of issues with too little water. Oftentimes, we have too much water. In general, though, our long term here in Greenville, we have the, the, the Tar River, we have about 1,900 cubic feet per second, so like 2,000 cubic feet every second. And that that's converts to 1.2 billion gallons per day, so a gallon of milk, right? If you can try to envision one billion of those, that's how much water will flow by Greenville in the Tar River every day. Greenville pulls out about 10 million, 10 to 12 million gallons each day. That's only about 1% of the flow that goes by, okay? So we're not usually in a, in, a, in a situation where we don't have enough water. But you've seen places like California, right, where they have had water limitation issues. Yeah, anybody familiar or have heard about what's going on in California? Yeah, they have a big, it is a big drought, yeah. The interesting thing, if you look, if you go to California, a lot of their, their water supply, how, how much of that state gets their water is from snow melt in the mountains. Okay, so all winter long, there's snow that, that, gets, that falls and it deposits the snowpack, all right? Then as it's, the spring comes and it starts to warm up, that snow melts slowly and they capture it in, the, in these reservoirs, okay? And then they can pull water from that to, uh, to, to provide to different cities. Los Angeles is one of the main ones, all right? So what's happened though is they've had some issues with climate change where they're not getting as much snowfall or it's not falling as snow, it's a little bit warmer, and it's falling as rain, all right? So they're not getting this, 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 this springtime melt that is gonna fill up their, their reservoirs. So they have some issues with quantity. Fortunately, we don't have that, but we do deal with the issue of quality quite a bit around here. That's our biggest concern in, in North Carolina. Uh, one of the most transformative uh, events as far as water quality goes in the United States was what's called the Cuyahoga River Fire. All right, anybody ever been to Cleveland? No. Cleveland, no. Cleveland rocks, no. Cleveland rocks. Yeah, Cleveland. So there's a river there, uh, the Cuyahoga River, and what had happened is there's a lot of industry all along the Cuyahoga River. And so these industries were, were dumping contaminants or there was chemicals getting into the river. And then one day they were doing a lot of, uh, uh, of welding and, and bridge work on this bridge here. Well, the sparks were falling from the, from the welding and it basically caught the river on fire, right? Big red flag, that's a problem. I don't want to drink that water, right? 
you guys seen in, uh, there's been some, some, uh, some issues with fracking or some, some looking at if there's uh, petroleum getting into some, water, some groundwater wells where people can light their, their tap water with a lighter. Have you guys seen that? No? Okay, so, so, if you have, so if you can light your water on fire, that's not a good thing, right? Just, just, if you don't take anything else away today, that's a bad thing, okay? So this sort of was a major incident, and it brought a lot of attention to, hey, we need to start taking more care of our water quality and looking at how we protect that water. Um, have you guys looked at, have you heard about Flint, Michigan? What's, what's the issue in Flint, Michigan? Lead, Lead right? Where's lead coming from? Do you know? Yes. Old pipes. That's right. So what happened? In, so some of you guys, it sounds like you know a little familiar, but they had they had water supply that was coming from Lake Huron, really high quality water, and then they were forced to transition to the Flint River, which has a lot of uh, ions and other contaminants in it, and they didn't treat the water appropriately. Really, what was happening is they didn't add some phosphorus to kind of continue to. Uh, the phosphorus basically created the seal inside of the lead pipe so that there was, there was no way for the lead to interact with the water. They didn't put that in, they didn't add, and then they added a lot of chlorine for disinfection, and the chlorine was actually kind of stripping out that phosphate. And then the chlorine, once that phosphate was gone, it started stripping out the iron and the lead, and that's how the lead was starting to get into the water from these old pipes. And you can see that, you know, you were seeing the, you can see the, the brown water here, that's due to the chlorine stripping out the iron initially in the iron pipes. So you, you could see definitely a different color there in the, in the water system. All right, so we, what's that? Sorry, I thought I heard a question. Uh, so we don't have this, right now, we don't have this kind of an issue here in eastern North Carolina. All right, so it's not something we're worried about. We're worried about some other different types of water quality issues. What types of pollutants do you see here? Dirt, sediment, runoff, right? So we get sediment from either you know, streams where we have too much water going through and scouring out or eroding those, the, the stream channel. So we get a lot of sediment and dirt. Uh, it doesn't, you don't really want to go fishing here. You don't want to go swimming, right? It looks pretty gross, right? All right. Um, what else do you see here? So we had sediment. Somebody said algae. You're going to hear a lot more about algae here from, um, from, Mr. from Mr. Mark Vanderborg, OK? Um, but this is what causes algae. Does anybody know? What's the most, uh, mo most common cause of algae? Sun contributes. What's that? Fishies. Not fishies. Nutrients. Too much nutrients in the water. Okay? And so we can have, and the nutrients can cause algae to, to grow and bloom. And then we, we can cause uh, fish kills either due to lack of oxygen or other chemicals or, or compounds that are released by the algae. You guys will hear a little bit more about that here in a moment. But we're concerned here in eastern North Carolina, especially in the Tar and Pamlico rivers, about n nutrients because to the point that we actually classify those waters. The Division of Water Resources, they classify those rivers as nutrient sensitive. Basically, if we get too much nutrients, then they're automatically going to have an algal bloom. That doesn't happen everywhere, but our waters are just very susceptible to it. So we have different ways that nutrients are getting into that water. Okay? We have runoff from ag fields where we put fertilizer. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, livestock operations. We have wastewater treatment plants that we try to get a lot of those nutrients out, but oftentimes we don't get all of the nutrients. And then stormwater runoff, where we get a lot of atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, and that washes off of the, off of the, the pavement surfaces and into our waterways. Okay? So we've got a lot of different, there's a variety of sources of, of nutrients that can come into our, our waterways, and it's not always at a, at a centralized one individual spot. All right? Talk about wastewater plants, and usually we think about, you know, most cities and, and developed areas, we have sort of a, a centralized plant. This is a, an image of, um, this is Moorhead City down in Carteret County. All right? They have a centralized or, or a city municipal wastewater plant. All the wastewater, these red lines here, are the sewer pipes. All that waste goes to that, that central plant, and they process it and treat it very well and they, before they discharge the water uh, either over land or into the waterways. Okay? But in the area outside of that yellow dotted line is septic tank. Okay? So they are treating water. So a lot of homes uh, treat water or treat the wastewater on site. Okay? It, who, you, most of you guys, it seems like from where the schools where you're at, are probably going to be outside of areas that have a centralized 
septic, a centralized wastewater treatment system. So you probably a lot of your homes have septic systems, right? And they're very common around North Carolina, especially in eastern North Carolina. One of the issues, though, is that the septic systems, the waste that comes through there, and we're usually concerned about nitrogen, okay? Converting it from an organic form into nitrate. And we assume a lot of times that that nitrate is going to go through the soil as, as it's discharged underground uh, through pipes, and it's going to go through the soil and be removed or filtered out. But if that doesn't happen and it gets down to the water table, then it can start to basically migrate those, the nitrate and the nutrients into a nearby river, stream, or other type of waterway. So it's really hard to get at this type of a, a source of nutrients. If you, look at, if you look at a home that's, or a development area that's on the water, you can have homes, you know, hundreds of homes in a very dense area that are all having plumes of, of nitrogen coming from it. All right? So I mentioned stormwater runoff, and that's another issue uh, that I, I spend a lot of time working on. Um, and the issue here is that when we start to increase the amount of imperviousness in a, uh, in a watershed, okay? So when we don't have any, any imperviousness, like a forested area, all right, the water, when we have rainfall, that water balance, about 40% goes evapotranspiration, 50% goes infiltration, and only 10% of that actually leaves and flows across the surface and goes into a stream or waterway. And so whenever that water flows across it, it can carry contaminants or pollutants with it. Well, as we start to increase the amount of imperviousness, we can, uh, we start to decrease the infiltration and evapotranspiration and start to increase the runoff. So now we've only got 10, per, 10 to 20 percent of the area is impervious, but we've already doubled the runoff, okay? When we go to something that's more like a residential neighborhood, okay, 30 percent of that water is now runoff, and we've gone down to 35 percent for infiltration and evapotranspiration, three times the amount of runoff. And we get in heavily, highly urbanized areas, then we have very, very high impervious, 75 to 100 percent impervious. Then we can have you know, runoff five times as much as what the pre-developed condition was. All right. So we're increasing a lot of volume of runoff from those areas. So, what's that? Sure. Yeah. Sorry about that. So impervious is like concrete or asphalt or rooftop. So where water that falls on it cannot go through that surface. It has to flow along that surface. Grass or soil is pervious, meaning that water can flow into that and, and flow down through the soil and into the groundwater. Okay? Good? Good? Yeah. Um, if you have questions or clarifications, let me know. So the, you know, I, I'm interested in my area is working on solutions to where we can develop an area, have homes and commercial areas, but we can also treat the water or the stormwater from it. So we have different practices or techniques here for development. Bioretention cell. This is where water comes from a parking lot usually. It gets captured and then the water infiltrates into the soil or it gets filtered before it goes into the storm pipe. Okay? So that basically removes pollutants and it captures um, and filters that water. Swales, these, a lot of times in, in, in neighborhoods you'll see swales in, or, or ditches, we call them a lot. Water can then soak into the ground. Um, we can look at different ways to develop. Instead of having such large, large home lots, we can kind of cluster the development in areas and keep a lot of the, the, a lot of the areas forested in conservation. Um, in ECU, we constructed a stormwater wetland. So we have a wetland on campus that, uh, that basically captures all the runoff from this parking lot in the back, and then it flows through here and treats that water before it goes into Greens Mill Run, which is a major stream in, in the city. Permeable pavement is another way that we can reduce runoff. So this is, this is really neat. It, this looks like just bricks here, but what's down below is a, about 12 to 14 inches of stone rock. And so what happens is there are gaps in between these bricks. Water, when it falls on the surface, flows in between those bricks and fills up that stone layer below. And then that water that fills up during a rainstorm, after the storm, the water's still sitting there, it can then soak slowly into the ground. So that water has been eliminated from running off, whereas like a, 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 an asphalt parking lot would just run off that water into the nearest waterway or pipe. Um, you guys know what Rice Krispie Treats are? Yeah. Yes. I don't have any for you today. I'm sorry. Aww. But, well, because, just hold on, just hold on. All right, so if you ever see concrete that looks like a Rice Krispie Treat, all right? I know, I know, that was, that was bad. We're right before lunch, aren't we? All right, if you ever see concrete that looks like a Rice Krispie Treat, that's a type of permeable pavement. 
in between the stones, which are kind of like the Rice Krispies, water can flow through that and down into the, into the, the pavement or the stone layer below. Anybody have a rain barrel at their house? Or we'll use that, rain barrel, sister, okay. So that's another way to capture runoff or capture water that would be runoff and then use it some, some other way. We have these cisterns, which are like rain barrels at ECU, and they're used for washing their vehicles. So we're gonna have, I mean, populations are gonna continue to grow. So with populations growing, we're gonna have more and more areas, natural areas converted to residential neighborhoods, schools, uh, shopping areas, uh, roadways, and so forth. So there's gonna be more and more uh, uh, impervious area that we need to treat, uh, treat that water coming from it to protect our water quality. You can see here sort of a map of, of North Carolina transitioning from 1990. You can see there's not very much red in that map. Okay, transitioning to 2010, you see especially in the center of the state, so a lot of red transitioning over 20 years. And then this is what's projected in only about, uh, I guess, 14, 15 years from now, 2030. All right, so we have a lot, of, lot more growth and population growth here in North Carolina that we expect. So I hope that you kind of see that there's a relationship between uh, the urban areas. This is an image of Greenville, uh, downtown Greenville, right by the Tar River. There's a relationship. You know, we love, you talked about earlier, or a lot of you are really excited. You like, be, you like fishing, right? You like swimming. You like being in the water. But we have to have good quality water, right? If we have a lot of sediments and nutrients and algae go in, that are in the water, then you don't want to go swimming there. You don't want to be fishing there. So we have to, it's no longer a valuable, uh, it no, no longer has the value that we, we thought it initially had to where we want to live by it and, and take advantage of that resource. So we have to look at ways to protect the water, uh, the water quality by removing those sediments, the nutrients, and other pollutants uh, uh, here in, in North Carolina. And so that's sort of, that's sort of uh, a lot of the issues that I work on uh, in my position. I'm a, an engineer uh, at ECU in the Department of Engineering and Institute for Coastal Science and Policy. And so if, if any of you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Anybody? If not, if not, then I will turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mark Vanderborn.